What do we know about colour? Most of us know the primaries, red, yellow and blue, and that you can mix them. Some might even know how the eye perceives different shades, but roughly, that's the extent of common knowledge. Well, an atlas of rare and familiar colour wants to take us on a vibrant journey. The book examines a kaleidoscope of pigments housed at the Harvard Museums. They include a shade of brown from the bones of Egyptian mummies, a yellow which was made from cow's urine after they'd been fed mango leaves, and greens that contain so much arsenic they could kill you. Narayan Kandekar joins me now. He is the director of the Strauss Center at the Harvard Art Museums, and he wrote the introduction in an atlas of rare and familiar color. Hi, thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. So, please tell us why this all matters. I mean, what can it teach us about, you know, what we see around us every day, knowing so many shades of colour? So, if you think that a work of art is made by creating... A, sorry, if you think that a work of art is a series of decisions by the artist, then what we can do is interrogate the work of art and have a conversation with the artist, understand how it's made. And the artist is always choosing pigments. So what we're doing is finding out the thought process of the artist as they're creating the work of art. So what we're doing is asking the artist, how is this work of art made? Whereas when we go into an art gallery, we often think that why a work of art is made is the question to ask. But in fact, there are lots of different questions. And to be able to identify the pigments, we need a wide range of standards against which to conduct the analysis. So we can take a little sample from a work of art or do some non-invasive analysis. We can then compare the results from that analysis to our library of pigments. And to be able to do that very well, we need a lot of pigments. So that's why we have this big collection of pigments. And artists usually went to great lengths to come up with the colors that they had in mind. I mean, they took dangerous risks. Some of these colors are poisonous, for example, aren't they? Exactly. So there are people like Van Gogh who would use a pigment called emerald green, which is an arsenic-based pigment. Um, lead white, which is one of the oldest pigments, is based on lead. And people would use that. So they, they risk poisoning themselves to create the, the work of art. Cadmium is another example of a, a poisonous pigment. There are lots and lots of examples of these, and they're, they're used with great regularity across time. Okay, let's talk about the book uh, for a bit now. It showcases a particular collection, actually, Harvard University uh, Forbes Pigment Collection, founded by Edward Forbes. Can you please tell us how it came into being? I mean, why would anyone want to have a collection of colors, really? So Ed Edward Forbes was the second director of the museum, and he was a great visionary. He had ideas about using an art gallery as a laboratory for art. And so he was an amateur painter himself, and he wanted to understand how a work of art was made. So he would go around looking at works of art. He was buying for the collection in the early part of the 20th century, and it was a time when a lot of Americans were buying art and he was being taken for a ride sometimes by art dealers and to protect himself against the unscrupulous activities of what was going on, he wanted to better inform himself. So he carried out a lot of study of the original materials that artists would have used. And then he started collecting the materials to use as standards against which to, to make comparisons. So he, he really was building up this library so that he could make informed purchases as well as understand how the artists were making the works themselves. And there are more than 2,500 colors in this collection. Some of them are not available anymore though. They, they are only in your collection. But I can't get my mind around it. How can a color go extinct? So there, there are lots of ways that this happens. One example is lead tin yellow, which was a pigment that was used up until about 1750. The story is that it was replaced by Naples yellow, and then it was forgotten about until it was rediscovered in 1940. And there are lots of examples of these kinds of pigments. There's another yellow pigment that was forgotten about until it was rediscovered in 1998. So that's one way, you know, 
there's a, an alternative that comes along and replaces it in its use. Another thing is that manufacturers in the 20th century will make a pigment, they'll stop making it, and then people will just forget about it. So I was looking at a Harley Davidson paint called Hi-Fi Purple, and it has three pigments in it to make the purple. And one of them, an orange color, we couldn't identify, and there were no standards, and we have over 500 modern pigments as standards, and we couldn't find it. So it's something that was manufactured no longer manufactured and no longer available. So we, we couldn't identify it. But is it not possible to create these colors in labs? It is. You, you need to know they exist first. So once lead tin yellow was rediscovered by Richard Jacobi in Munich in 1940, then people went on and most notably Nick Easto did his PhD at the Courtauld Institute in the 1980s on different ways of manufacturing lead tin yellow. So it's now commercially available again, but for a long period of time it wasn't. And it's actually very useful to know that because it allows us to look at a work of art and if it has lead tin yellow in it, we know that it was made before 1750 or after 1940. So that rules out a big chunk of timeline. And if we can use the provenance, the art historian's research, to trace the existence of that painting back before 1750, then we know we've got a genuine work of art. And I think a good example of this was the Jackson Pollock painting uh, that was rediscovered in uh, 2007. People were really excited about it, but then it was uh, found out that this was a fake because a, a specific red color that was uh, used in the painting was manufactured 20 years after Jackson Pollock's death. Were you involved in that as Harvard? Yeah, we, we were very involved. We looked at three of these paintings and they had incredible provenance that went right back. So the owner's parents were very good friends with Jackson Pollock. And so the provenance went right back to Jackson Pollock. But when we looked at the paintings, what we found is that there were pigments. There was pigment red 254, there was pigment yellow 151, and these were not available during Jackson Pollock's lifetime. So we identified these pigments, we developed a new instrumentation method in the field, and we identified the pigments, and then we were able to say these were not available during the artist's lifetime. So the attribution to Jackson Pollock needed to be re-examined. And what is the rarest color in your collection? So I, I think that our ball of Indian yellow is one of our rarest. There are very few of these that still exist. It's a pigment that was outlawed by the British government in the early 20th century, and there's, there are not many balls, intact balls of Indian yellow. And it's a pigment that's made by feeding a cow mango leaves and then collecting its urine and drying the urine. And then this is purified and turned into a pigment. It was widely used in India and in Persia, but it dropped out of use. And so the existence, it's not maybe not rare to manufacture, but nobody wants to do that to a cow. That would just be unnecessarily cruel. So what we have, a, a residue from a production that used to happen but no longer does. And do you have a personal uh, favorite in your collection? So I, I really can't pick a favorite color. You know, I, I have access to every color available. I mean, there's, there's no point choosing a favorite. I mean, of course, it shouldn't be uh, easy considering the almost 3,000 options you have. Well, it's, it's, it really is just too many. It's, um, and I, I don't want to point my finger at one of them and say this is what I like most. I really enjoy looking at each of them because each of them has its own story. And as you dive into it, you discover more and more about its history, about its usage. And it's, it's just fascinating. And what color are you wearing today? Is there anything special? I'm wearing blue. So I've got a, a blue tie, blue shirt, blue jacket. And why blue? Why did you choose this color? It, it's a color that suits my complexion, and that's, that's the truth of it. Narayan Kandekar, thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today.